for the entire collection of Isaiah's writings and as the actual beginning of his ancient book. In this presentation, I shall first explain why this is so and then clarify the latter-day context of the passage, which is set in Judah and in Jerusalem, subjects which are largely unrecognized and rarely discussed in latter-day saint circles and classes. Why this passage actually refers, in its latter-day context, to a great temple yet to be built in Jerusalem will be made clear. And finally, I will comment on how it is both legitimate and instructive for Latter-day Saints to liken the Isaiah 2 passage to themselves and their own temples in these mountains, uh, the Jerusalem context of this prophecy notwithstanding. Now, just for a moment, uh, let me uh, talk about Isaiah's lead prophecy. This may be new to some. And I'd like to use the, uh, as a visual here for a moment, let's make sure it's projecting this wonderful photograph of uh, the great Isaiah scroll from Cave 1 at Qumran, one of the collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and maybe the, the most wonderful of all of them. This is, uh, of course, the photograph taken in the series of photographs by Dr. John Trevor, back when the scrolls first came to life in the basement of uh, the uh, the American School of Oriental Research on Saladin Street in Jerusalem. Uh, this was back in the 1940s. And uh, I'm now a fellow there at, at that institution, which is now called the Albright Institute. And I have been in that basement many times doing lab work. And there have been occasions when I could almost see John Trevor with his uh, uh, old single uh, reflex camera uh, taking pictures of this scroll down in that basement. It's an amazing story. In any case, uh, uh, point one, Isaiah's lead prophecy. If you put the chapters of Isaiah in their chronological order, in the order in, in which they describe events and in fact were, uh, were created, um, they would look something like this. And chapter two would be the earliest and beginning of, of all of the selections of the book. Now, uh, I want to break this down a little bit for you. Uh, this is done in the chapter, uh, in the chapter in, in the publication. Uh, but this is instructive, and, and I wanted to take some time and, and do it in the chapter because I don't know anywhere else this information is covered in any Latter-day writings on the book of Isaiah. The first major segment of chapters in Isaiah, chapter 2 through 35, um, are called by scholars outside the LDS uh, uh, community, uh, First Isaiah. Uh, I'm only half in agreement with that terminology, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But they certainly can be clumped together in one specific segment of understanding how Isaiah is, is constructed. And there is an overriding theme in these chapters. That theme is repent, house of Israel, or be destroyed and deported by the, uh, by the Assyrians who were the masters of the ancient Near East in the 8th century BC when uh, Isaiah was prophesying. Now there are uh, a variety of other sub-themes which work their way through this section of Isaiah, most notably the prophecy we're talking about today, which is a latter-day triumphant prophecy and which kicks off the book. But as you know, as soon as you're into Isaiah chapter 2, verse 5 or 6, you're already into the portion where Isaiah is excoriating the people of Jerusalem of his own time for their misdeeds and their failure to follow the law of God and, and the prophetic word. And that goes all the way through these chapters with, with a couple of sidelines chastising everyone else in the ancient Near East and also some significant latter-day uh, foreshadowings of, of restoration and things that, that we love so much. But basically, the theme is repent or be destroyed. And it's very timely because that's the, that's the cusp of the disaster upon which the house of Israel was placed in Isaiah's day. Um, just very quickly to rehearse how that all came about, uh, in the last three decades of the 8th century BC, between 732 and 700, uh, Israel, both kingdoms, were attacked three times by the Assyrian Empire. Uh, resulting in the death of many thousands and the deportation of many tens of thousands of people. 
and uh, the extinction of the northern of the two kingdoms. The first northern deportation came after the attack of 732 BC. The second northern deportation after the attack on reduced Israel in 724 BC. Uh, as we say, tens of thousands were resettled in the eastern part of the empire and became lost Israel. Many thousands fled south, uh, not waiting for the debacle in the north, and resettled in Judah, which gave them uh, safety for a time. That was only for a time. As those of you who are careful readers of the biblical record and history will know, Israel also attacked and nearly completely obliterated Judah in 701 BC as a result of the rebellion of King Hezekiah at the death of Sargon II in 705. And uh, according to Sennacherib's own annals, over 200,000 people of all the tribes of Israel, because by then Judah was a kingdom of all 12 tribes, uh, were carried away from Judah, captive, and only Jerusalem was spared this horrific debacle. There were maybe 20,000 people living behind the walls of Jerusalem, including the great wall which Hezekiah had constructed around the western neighborhoods of Jerusalem. And those were all that was left of the entire people of Israel remaining in the Holy Land, in the land of Israel. <laughs> Everyone else was dead or deported. This disaster uh, uh, was, was the, a centerpiece of all that Isaiah warned about and all that Isaiah had to deal with in the aftermath of, of, of the year 700. Let me just sum up if I could. From 732 to 701 BC, a conservative estimate would be that some 500,000 people of all the tribes of Israel, including many of Judah, over 200,000 taken from that kingdom, were deported by the Assyrians and known thereafter as lost Israel. Primarily, their descendants uh, uh, assimilated into the cultures of the Fertile Crescent and the East, what is now Iraq, Iran, because that was the crossroads of the world. The assimilation uh, continued for many, many centuries with every new uh, 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 caravan, with every new trade route, with every new uh, 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 war, with every new migration. And the uh, heritage of the assimilated Israelites seeped in over 28 centuries to the heritage of every family of the earth. So that literally all the earth today uh, are, are lost Israel. But no, it not. Uh, that's, that's the major thing that we're after is to inform them who they are. But um, uh, a lost Israel became lost not because you did not know where it was. Even the Bible tells you where they were taken. Lost Israel became lost because they forgot who they were over a period of generations and assimilation. And this, of course, Isaiah had to deal with in his book. Now, that makes the second big block of chapters in Isaiah thematically very different from the first big block of chapters in Isaiah. The theme of the second big block of chapters from chapter 40 to chapter 66, which our friends in the world at large uh, of religious studies will, will often refer to as second Isaiah, and some will break it down even further to second and third Isaiah, but for me it's just instructive to use the second Isaiah at Noman. The theme there is introduced right at the outset, uh, uh, where Isaiah is told by the Lord to comfort Israel, comfort my people, tell them that their tribulation is now over. And so these chapters look to a distant future. They not only describe the, the devastated situation in which uh, 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 Israel is now that is, Israel now finds itself, with Jerusalem all that is left. But it predicts a day when things will get better, when there will be a gathering, when there will be a restoration, when the glory of the Lord will be restored to the house of Israel. And so it's a theme of necessarily of comforting, because when everyone is dead and deported, there's not much use in still saying we can't die. 
So, so very different to me. Uh, add to that uh, the middle portion of chapter of the book of Isaiah, which is uh, clearly anyone who reads these will recognize that they are a copy of material that occurs in 2 Kings 18 through 20, a strictly historical account of the attack of 701 BC. Starting out, if you read Isaiah 36, 1, with the very same words you read in 2 Kings 18, 13. Now in the 14th year of Hezekiah, king of Judah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the walled, fenced cities of Judah and took them. Not a one was left but Jerusalem. Of course, the rest of Isaiah 36 through 39, which is to say 2 Kings 18 through 20, talks about how Jerusalem managed to be spared through the miraculous intervention of the Lord. And this was the only silver lining in an otherwise very dark cloud for the house of Israel. But these historical passages, which were likely, in the form we now have them, composed even after Isaiah's time, closer perhaps to 620 BC during the reign of Josiah, eventually found their way as a very necessary historical bridge inserted between Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 40 to make sense of the whole book and be a bridge from the chapters that have the one theme to the chapters that have the other theme. Okay? When exactly they found their way in there is unclear. Whether they are, are uh, in uh, the Isaiah compilation, say, that Lehi was familiar with, or whether this happens as, uh, as somewhat later in the 6th or 5th century is not clear to us, but that this material was all available to the Book of Mormon writers is very clear because they had with them the brass plates, which not only included Isaiah's prophecies, but also the history of the Jews, which would have included 2 Kings. Now add to that chapter 1, which in terms of its chronological uh, 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 theme, would come after the attack of 701. Isaiah chapter 1 starts out by talking about Isaiah's ministry during all the kings of Judah that he knew, um, with the exception of Manasseh, in whose reign he became old and during whose reign he was executed. Uh, but Isaiah 1 describes the desolate situation of Jerusalem as the only surviving city, not only of Judah, but of all the house of Israel. From head to foot, Isaiah said, the house of Israel had been bruised and beaten, and only the daughter of Zion, the city of Jerusalem, remained. In fact, Isaiah 1 says, were it not for the fact that the daughter of Zion had been spared, Israel would be desolate, like Sodom and Gomorrah, completely extinct. It's a very dramatic chapter. And of course, it's describing events in the situation of 700 BC, just after the attack. Now, it appears in our compilation at the beginning because it seems deliberately to have been given as a preface to all of Isaiah's writings. But chronologically, it would not be before Isaiah 2. It would, in fact, be right before Isaiah 40. In this regard, it's much like the first section of the Doctrine and Covenants, which, although it appears at the head of our compilation of sections in the Doctrine and Covenants, actually chronologically would fall uh, much later, somewhere around section 66 or 67. And so uh, there's a nice uh, parallel there that, that we can use to explain why chapter of Isaiah appears where it does. And thus you have uh, the entire compilation of Isaiah. Now going back to how our friends outside of uh, the Mormon world feel about uh, Isaiah, if they are scholars of Isaiah, and their recognition that the thematic differences in part one and part two are so stark that they have to be recognized, most of them will simply insist that chapters 40 through 66 were written uh, a century or more later than Isaiah lived by another author whom they anonymously, uh, or whose name they do not know, so they simply call him uh, Second Isaiah. And maybe they'll add also another author called Third Isaiah. Tarot Isaiah and Trito Isaiah. Um, for, for many reasons, Latter-day Saints have a difficult time accepting that model that Isaiah was written by two very different writers distant from each other by over a century in time. Uh, we can't really reconcile that model, uh, which puts a 
second Isaiah writing after 600 BC with the Book of Mormon, where we have chapters from the second part of Isaiah in Nephi's possession when he leaves Jerusalem. Well, actually, the second time he leaves Jerusalem because he had to go back to the place, as you recall. But uh, it is instructed from uh, an LDS point of view, I believe, to recognize the stark differences between the first part of Isaiah and the second part of Isaiah. Therefore, in my conversations with Isaiah scholars around the world, I use the terminology Isaiah part one and Isaiah part two, uh, which I think is, is a very good way to discuss with our friends outside of Mormonism the book of Isaiah without giving in to the insistence that the second part was written by an entirely different uh, uh, author. Thematic differences do not necessarily mean separate authorship. And that's an important thing to always stress. So we have the entire book of Isaiah as it is, and the whole purpose of the last 20 minutes was simply to justify my first point. <laughs> Which is that if you put the chapters in their chronological order, uh, Isaiah 2 stands as the lead prophecy for the entire collection of Isaiah's writing. And therefore, it's the kickoff chapter. And if you're a football fan like I am, not only did you have a very good time last night, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you, you look at the kickoff as, as really the thing you anticipate. And what greater way to start the book of Isaiah than with this grand prophecy of what it will all eventually lead to, restored Jerusalem in latter-day glory. It is of note, by the way, that Isaiah 2 is the first chapter in the lengthy Isaiah segment, which appears in 2 Nephi. In other words, when Nephi copied Isaiah, he started with Isaiah 2 in that big block in 2 Nephi. Now, it's true that he quotes a couple of chapters in but there's a context for that. He was actually teaching those writings to Laman and Levi. So when he talks about what he talked to Laman and Levi about, he quotes the chapters. But when he goes to say, I'm going to write Isaiah into my plates now, he starts with chapter 2 because that's the natural start of the book. Okay, point 2. The context of the prophecy. Now I'll get some email about that last part, but here's where the email's really going to come. <laughs> the Great Jerusalem Temple Prophecy of Isaiah 2 does not have its context in Mormonism. We usually teach that it does. But the prophecy itself is very specific. It does not say Ephraim and Salt Lake City. <laughs> it does not say Joseph and Jackson County. It does not say America and the Mormons. And believe me, I love all of those. It says Judah and Jerusalem. And it says the last days, lest we make the error of thinking that Isaiah was speaking of his own time in setting this prophecy in Judah and Jerusalem. Let's read it. I'll just use the page from the book, and then we'll, we'll go into the scripture itself. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amot, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, I have sat in myriad classes where Isaiah has been taught, and no one ever points this out. I have read every book on Isaiah that's been written by an LDS author, and there are some very good ones. No one ever points this out, not in the best of them. And yet we owe it to ourselves as students of Scripture to understand context of Scripture before we ever attempt to apply it. Well, let's move forward then. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountain, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. What is the mountain of the Lord's house? This is the mountain of the Lord's house. We refer to it in Hebrew as Har Habayit, which means the mountain of the house. Har is mountain. Uh, Bayit is house. And that's an abbreviated form. This is, this is the Jewish form of speaking of this site. Uh, the house is the house of the Lord. The, the fullness of this uh, uh, um, uh, phrase in English 
would be the mountain of the house of the Lord. I've got uh, parentheses here, as you can see. But if you take the entire scripture out of Isaiah uh, chapter 2, it uh, reads like this. The mountain of the house of the Lord. Har be Yahweh. And I'm saying now the divine name without substitution. Because I'm in an audience where I feel that will not be improper. If I were in a Jewish, Jewish audience, I would never say Yahweh. I would simply say Adonai, Hashem, or some uh, acceptable substitute for the divine name. But the phrase, mountain of the Lord's house, in the Hebrew of Isaiah 2 is actually Har Beit Yahweh, mountain of the house of the Lord. I, uh, in the King James English of Isaiah 2, instead of saying house of the Lord, they use an apostrophe possessive, mountain of the Lord's house. So this is the way that it looks in the Hebrew. And by the way, this is the way that it is rendered in, uh, the, uh, in the parallel passage in Micah, where Micah is quoting Isaiah 2. Uh, mountain of the Lord's house in Isaiah 2, but mountain of the house of the Lord in Micah, and mountain of the house of the Lord in the Hebrew, Har Beit Yahweh. Uh, and so there we have the scripture again in a more familiar form there, uh, formatted almost as it would stand in, in, the, in the columns of your Bible. Again, the, uh, the um, uh, context, Judah, Jerusalem, the last days, the site, the mountain of the Lord's house, the Hag, Beit, Yahweh, that this place would be established in the tops of the mountains. That's where Jerusalem is, at the very top of the hills of Judea. And uh, the exalted in all nations would flow to it. The last days would be a time when everyone wants to go to Jerusalem. And, and we are... Proof of that prophecy. Everybody wants to go to Jerusalem. And the nice thing about today is that pretty much everybody can. All it takes is money. <laughs> now, uh, jump down, if you will, to uh, verse 3. Many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Okay? And that's where we take our book title from. Ascending the mountain of the Lord. Going up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Right. Uh, what is the, the house of the God of Jacob? Well, Jacob is Israel, so it's the house of the God of Israel. It's the temple of the God of Israel that sits on the mountain of the Lord. Now, in Isaiah's time, and because he writes as informed by his own time, this is the temple of Solomon. That's the place where the house of God was, the site of the temple of Solomon on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. But remember, the prophecy we're dealing with is not describing that temple. That temple sat there in Isaiah's time, but he looks forward to when that mountain of the Lord will be occupied by a latter-day temple on that mountain of the house of God. Okay. By the way, the very handsome cover we have for this book. I'm happy to say that the Religious Studies Center freed up some shekels to buy this art <laughs> to put onto the cover of this book. It's painted by the world-famous uh, archaeological, uh, biblical uh, illustrator Balaj Palo, and uh, we couldn't be happier to have that artwork on the front of this book. Uh, but it's not Solomon's temple that Isaiah was prophesying of. One, however, that would be in the place on the site of Solomon's temple, there on Mount Moriah, which is located specifically in 1 Chronicles 3 as the site of the house of the Lord. Now, as you know, Solomon's temple was destroyed and a second temple was built upon that site by the returnees to Zion from Babylonian captivity. We call it the Temple of Zerubbabel. And eventually, even it was removed, uh, ceremoniously and reverently taken down, disassembled in 20 BC to make room for an even grander structure that was the temple that stood on Mount Moriah in the Savior's day. Uh, the other second temple, Jews call both the Zerubbabel and Herod's temple the second temple. You have to ask them about the math of that, but they do. Um, it's because the temple was not destroyed by another, and the service did not stop. All the time Herod's temple was being built, the service continued. Kind of like UDOT builds roads, you know, it grows the part of it and lets you drive by the other part. But the sacrifices never stopped, all the while this, this one was being built. It was a house that was beloved of the Savior. He called his father's house and his own house. 
So let's make sure we understand the sanctity of this place. But it too was called the Second Temple because it actually finished a continuous temple period. And then if you're asking yourself, well, who deconstructs a temple and then builds another one? Well, I live in Ogden. <laughs> <laughs> so there's precedent for that. <laughs> for our Jewish friends, then, this is Har Habayit, the Temple Mount. And as some of you would know, uh, Orthodox Jewish tradition, and even the daily prayer of Orthodox Jews, maintains that in a future day, a third temple will be built on the site of the ancient temples. That, by the way, is Jewish terminology. When you speak of the third temple, you're not speaking of Herod's temple, that's still the second temple. Third temple is futuristic, it's messianic. It's looking forward to something which everyone wants to know, how will that ever happen? Because given the way things are in the Middle East today, you can't imagine it. But our Jewish friends recognize this. They use the terminology Third Temple. They use the terminology Har Habayit, the mountain of the house. They use the terminology Temple Mount. And that's a tradition that is very much recognized in Christianity and even in, in the Latter-day Saint tradition. Although no one understands how this could happen because as important as this site is to our Jewish friends, to our Christian friends, and to us, it is important to our Muslim friends as well. It is a sacred site to them. The Haram al-Sharif, or al-Aqsa, a noble sanctuary, site of the Dome of the Rock, built from 687 to 691 AD during the time of the Caliph Abdul Malik, and the third holiest shrine of Islam, commemorating sacred events in the story of the Prophet Muhammad. <clears throat> and so it's difficult to imagine how prophecies that we find in the Bible can ever be fulfilled given the situation that we have in Jerusalem today. It simply is there in the book and it's simply something that we have to deal with. Uh, here's my disclaimer, because I love my Jewish friends, I love my Muslim friends, uh, I'm like Nephi, I have love for everybody, uh, and my hope is in the gospel for them. Uh, but this disclaimer is something I have to put in. And I won't even read it quickly the way they do on the insurance commercials. <laughs> this study, both the presentation and the associated book chapter, does not attempt to predict how or when the latter-day Jerusalem Temple of Isaiah II will be built upon the mountain of the house. Nor does this study take any position on religious, cultural, or political issues concerning present-day Jerusalem. All that this study aims to do is clarify the context and implication of the prophecy in Isaiah 2. I leave it to God to work his ways. Or as Abraham of old said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Now I spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. And I love the Jewish people. I love the Muslim people. I love the Christians of Jerusalem as well. And I love the Mormons there, too. And I've been able to work with so many of them. And it's important for us to be especially sensitive about this. And not to proclaim things that we do not know. And not to put out there models or theories or timetables that we do not have in any authoritative source and which we are not authorized by our prophetic leaders to do and for which there is no real evidence. All I would say in this presentation is that Isaiah 2 is what it is. And if you want to understand it for its context, you have to understand these issues. So now, the place we love, Jerusalem. <coughs> Point three. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. I think I should have a go in there somewhere. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Let's take a look at this interesting passage. Here it is at the end of verse 3. After all that's been talked about in terms of its context and the hope of this wonderful latter day, perhaps I should add millennial uh, 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 house of the Lord that will be uh, at this site uh, and, and all the world, all the world who will love it. 
all nations. Okay. Isaiah concludes this grand temple prophecy with this couplet, Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And this is where Latter-day Saints have the most fun, I think, with Isaiah chapter 2. Because we take this remarkable couplet, and uh, more perhaps than any other of, of the uh, elements in the, in the prophecy, we insist that this is talking about us. Okay? We split the parallel, and we refer to ourselves as the society of that Zion from which should go forth the law. And then we still recognize that also in a future day the word of the Lord will come from Jerusalem. Contextually, there's a problem with that. Applicatively, no. Let's deal with context first. It is a single literary component. Here you can see it, and those of you that read Hebrew will know it says, Ki metzion tetze Torah, v'davar Yahweh Yerushalayim. From Zion, that's how we say Zion in Hebrew, shall go forth Torah. You see law in your English version, but it actually says Torah in Hebrew. And the word of Jehovah Yahweh, the Lord, from Jerusalem. <coughs> and again, this is what we call in Isaiah studies a synonymous parallel. A couplet <coughs> saying the same thing twice using synonyms. Now, Isaiah is full of this type of writing. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the passages <coughs> of Isaiah are couplets. Most of them are synonymous. Okay? Some of them are actually um, anti-synonymous. They actually parallel um, opposites. But most of the great prophecies, and you don't see this very easy in English, the poetry and the, and the couplet structure is much easier to see in Hebrew. But this is the way that virtually all of Isaiah is written. Um, and, and what this is basically saying is the same thing twice. Out of Zion shall go forth Torah. Out of Jerusalem will go forth the word of God, which is the Torah. The Torah is the law of God. Specifically in the Jewish conversation, this is the law of Morris, the Torah of uh, Morris, now Moses. Sorry. <laughs> I have no idea who Morris is. Uh, we call them both Mo, but it doesn't work here. Uh, uh, the law of Moses, the Torah of Moshe. Uh, whether or not uh, uh, Torah will be specifically the law of Moses in its latter-day millennial context, or whether it will encompass the greater uh, uh, laws of God that, 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 we, that we couple with the law of Moses in all of our understanding, and in our understanding of both Old and New Testament, uh, is not addressed. Okay? Well, I, I think we have to be careful here in saying exactly what and what not Isaiah 2 is insisting on. But it says Torah, and that's the law of God in the Bible. And, and so from, from Jerusalem, from the original Zion, would go forth God's word to all the world, to all nations including the Gentile nations who are actually also Israel, though they know it not. They too are descended from those ancient lost tribes. Now, uh, in the Bible, Zion is always Jerusalem. Uh, I point this out to my Mormon students because in, in Mormonism we have a very um, uh, well-developed conversation about what Zion is, and, and it's a very uh, uh, a multiple use uh, word for us. We have Zion, uh, uh, the people of the Lord. Zion, the, the righteous, the pure in heart. Zion, uh, a, a place we used to live in in Missouri. Zion, which we call in general uh, our church headquarters here. Zion, the people of the Lord. Zion, the bank. Zion, the park. We <laughs> have Zion, Chrysler, Plymouth, Valiant, and Salt Lake City. But, uh, you know, uh, to Jews, Zion is one thing. And it was one thing in the context of Isaiah, really. This is clear. It's Jerusalem. It starts out with the first mention of Zion in 2 Samuel 5, when David conquers Jerusalem. 
and every other passage, including all the Zion passages in Isaiah, every other passage in the Bible that mentions Zion, contextually, that's Jerusalem. Now, I teach this to my students so they'll know when they're speaking with Jewish friends uh, what Zion means to them, because for us it can mean so many things. But contextually here in Isaiah 2, it's clear that it's speaking of Jerusalem in a synonymous couple. Now, that's the context. And if we recognize that context, we will understand what Isaiah was saying on the first and obvious level of his great Jerusalem temple prophecy. That from that great temple in that eventual latter day, the word of the Lord from the presence of the Lord, even if we may speculate, would emanate to all the world. So, to summarize, a Latter-day Temple of Judah in Jerusalem, Zion, from which Torah will go forth to all people, is the context of this great Jerusalem Temple prophecy. And again, something that we rarely, rarely mention in our classes. And I'm not sure why, because it doesn't devalue our own interpretations at all. In fact, I believe that if you're going to apply scripture, uh, you strengthen it by first understanding context. But the thing that we could ask ourselves now is, uh, what about us? What about the Latter-day Saints? If, in fact, the context is Jerusalem, are we okay doing what we do with this? Well, my answer is uh, uh, the Savior's answer. This ought ye to have done and not leave the other undone. We should certainly teach context, but uh, should anyone ever challenge me on the Latter-day Saint application of this, I will say, I'm with Nephi. If Nephi can do it, we can do it, and we can do it well. Because he did this with Isaiah, and he told us to do it. In instructing his brothers, he said, I did read many things unto them which were written in the books of Moses the Torah of Moshe, the Torah. But that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord their Redeemer, I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah, for I did liken all scriptures unto us, that it might be for our profit and learning. And that is very legitimately what we do with the great Jerusalem temple prophecy when we take it and use it as a great Salt Lake City temple prophecy, or a great, if I may be allowed this, Ogden temple prophecy, or a great Provo temple prophecy, or a great prophecy of the temples, which are metaphorically the mountains of the houses of the Lord in all the earth that we have built in these great latter days. And he doesn't just allow us to liken the scriptures, including Isaiah 2, in this one passage, he actually instructs the people of the latter days, do this with Isaiah. Hear ye the words of the prophet, Nephi said unto us, and liken them unto yourselves. And now, he said, I write some of the words of Isaiah. This is when he's going to put that big block of, uh, in 2 Nephi, starting with the great Jerusalem temple prophecy of Isaiah 2. And he's not now speaking to Laman and Lemuel anymore. This is directed exactly at us. Now I write some of the words of Isaiah, you folks of the latter days, that whoso of my people shall see these words, they lift up their hearts and rejoice for all men. Now these are the words, and ye may liken them unto you and unto all men. And that's what we do. Brothers and sisters, may we appreciate the book of Isaiah that book which the Savior gave us an explicit commandment to study, to search diligently, for great are the words of Isaiah, 3 Nephi 23, 1. May we particularly understand its context and all that it means for us in terms of who we are, because it's about Israel, and it is our family history, because we are of Israel. The Old Testament is our family history, as much as anything that's happened recently. And may we not only understand the context of the great Isaiah prophecy, but go to the house of the Lord ourselves, have a liking it unto ourselves, and there worship the Lord 
and spread forth his word until the time shall come that the great Jerusalem temple prophecy be fulfilled. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.